For more than 150 years, the Sununu Youth Services Center in Manchester, New Hampshire, housed a wide range of kids, from those accused of violent crimes to those who skipped school and even some who just had nowhere to go after a parent lost custody or another legal issue was being worked out. And over the years, there were dribs and drabs about incidents of mistreatment that happened there. But starting a few years ago, more than 500 people have come forward accusing at least 150 staff members of physical or sexual abuse over the past 60 years. As the new Boston Globe investigation details, quote, many who spent time there depicted as a house of horrors, rampant sexual abuse by staffers, beating so severe they broke bones, residents forced by staff to fight each other for food, solitary confinement stays that stretch for months, the kind of violence that leaves lasting psychological damage rippling through generations. And what's happened since certainly hasn't helped in any healing. To date, of the 150 people identified as perpetrators, only 11 have been charged, all of whom have pled not guilty. And even now, as state officials argue about the timeline to close the facility and whether to demolish it down the line, there's a slew of prominent people flat out unwilling to comment on any of this to the globe. Among them, former Department of Health and Human Services Commissioner Jeffrey Myers, former New Hampshire Attorney General turned New Hampshire Supreme Court Chief Justice Gordon McDonald, former governors John Lynch, Craig Benson, Judge Gregg, John Sununu, after whose father the center was renamed, and Lori Lutz, who led the state's child welfare agency in the 90s, who before hanging up on the globe responded tellingly, I want nothing to do with this story. I'm joined by the two undeterred people who do, the Globe's Dugan Arnett and Laura Cromaldi. Laura and Dugan, welcome and congratulations on a really important piece. Thanks for being here. Thank Thanks you, Jim. Laura, let me start with you. The sadism and violence you describe goes back almost to the beginning. Describe to people what the so-called water cure was that the governor of New Hampshire was talking about 90 years ago. The water care was something that uh, girls described having had happened to them at the facility. And this is a practice where young girls who were accused of some sort of wrongdoing would be disciplined by a uh, a person who would spray water in their face at a close range. And when a girl attempted to shield her face from the flow of the water, the uh, other staff members would hold on to her hands or her arms so she'd be unable to shield herself. And these were described, this kind of uh, treatment was described in newspaper stories in the 1930s and the governor of new hampshire himself described the yeah. the for that form of abuse for a report that was on the front page of the union leader and by the way that those girls were primarily pretty much undressed at the time of this water being sprayed at them am i not right about that yes they had to undress so uh, if uh, dugan a little fast forward to almost current times you detail the abuse that's alleged by a whole host of people that is just cringeworthy. Start with Michaela Jancy. What happened to her? Michaela's story is, is even among uh, some of those that, that we heard was, was pretty egregious. Um, she uh, says that she was uh, impregnated by a counselor there when she was uh, around the age of 14. Mm -hmm um found out she was pregnant um through a pregnancy test that was administered by the facility nurse um no one besides the nurse she said uh from the facility seemed particularly interested in sort of getting to the bottom of how someone that young could have become impregnated uh she says she was taken then and shortly after by a staffer to uh, a doctor's office uh, locally and um, uh, was was essentially taken in for an abortion. And again, uh, uh, a young teen becomes pregnant in a closed facility and n no one seems to care enough to try to get to the bottom of what happened to her. Uh, uh, Laura, how about David Meehan, whose lawsuit, I think it was in 2020, sort of opened the door on a lot of this. What happened to Mian? 
David Meehan's lawsuit is the main lawsuit and the one that has gotten the most attention over the years. He says he was sexually abused while he was uh, in the custody at the Youth Development Center. And he described uh, being sexually assaulted while uh, restrained. And uh, uh, more than once, from what I recall, right? These are not isolated incidents in most of these cases. Is that not true, Laura? David Meehan and others described uh, being abused over a period of time during their confinement at the Youth Development Center. You know, and Dugan, just one more. Robert Boudreau intentionally acted out, according to your piece, because he wanted to be put in solitary confinement. Why? Yeah, that, and that wasn't a unique, that wasn't sort of a unique uh, sentiment, I guess, that we heard from, from uh, some of these victims. Um, he was, he would be taken uh, to the edge of campus in a staffer's car and um, sexually assaulted there. And so he, you know, the way he described it is he learned uh, pretty quickly that he could, you know, if he was in solitary confinement, that sort of, that sort of thing couldn't happen. So as bad as solitary confinement was, it was so it was a bit better than the alternative. So shackled in solitary confinement is better than the treatment from the staff at the facility. Laura, I, I, as I said at the top from reading your piece, 11 people so far have been charged, but sort of shades of the Catholic Church here, no higher ups, no administrators, sort of like the bishops. They didn't know anything, even though they did. Is that what's going on here? Nobody above the staff level has been charged with anything? Yeah, and I think that one thing is worth pointing out here is that unlike um, situations where you had the clergy sex abuse scandal or in, or sex abuse scandals involving private schools, this is a state government run agency where uh, the governor had the authority to ap appoint the supervisors and the commissioner of the Department of Health and Human Services that um, ran, ran the facility. And um, in the last 20 years or so, you've seen state government in New Hampshire intervene in cases where there were there were allegations of sex abuse in institutions outside of government. That happened with the Diocese of Manchester, Manchester in, right. the, yeah, yeah. in the early 2000s. And then just recently in 2018, uh, the New Hampshire Attorney General's office mandated uh, that St. Paul's School uh, come to an agreement for monitoring in order to uh, settle claims of long-standing sexual abuse in that institution by uh, by employees. So you've seen over time that New Hampshire state government has intervened in outside institutions when they believed that they uh, could not be held, those institutions could not uh, be held accountable without outside monitoring to prevent and keep children safe. And here the question is, is who is going to step in, if anyone, to get the government in New Hampshire to take, a, take accountability for what happened at the Youth Development Center? Over well, you know, in answer to your question, Laura, you posed an interesting one in the piece you and Dugan wrote, is the Attorney General's office is essentially working for both sides in this thing. They're investigating claims from survivors at the same time that they're defending the state against claims from survivors. So how much trust can those people have in the AG's office there, Laura? I, I think that is going to be a, a, a very difficult um, proposition for the Attorney General's office to um, thread that that needle because just on its face it doesn't um, lend inspire itself. Inspire confidence. It doesn't inspire. It doesn't inspire confidence. And um, how could you, as someone coming forward to talk to an investigator who says they are looking into a, a criminal case? wonder, well, if what I say here, will you tell your colleague on the civil side and what, what yeah. sort of ramifications might that have for, for me down the road? You have to wonder if the assurances that the Attorney General's office has made saying that our criminal and civil divisions uh, are, are totally separate yeah. 
are going to uh, um, calm those fears and allow those people yeah. to um, tell their stories without uh, concern of recrimination. You know, speaking of tell their stories, Duke, and I, every time in a situation like this, even though there are very few this widespread and this horrible that come to light, I'm reminded of the incredible quote from Quentin Tarantino during Me Too, I knew enough to have done more. Why was this allowed to go on for so long? Was it just the CYA kind of thing all the way up the chain? Yeah, that's a, that's a little bit harder to get at. Um, there's, you know, at least there's mul multiple victims that we spoke with said that they reported um, the sexual abuse in some way, shape or form. Uh, were either written off or nothing came of it. Um, there, you know, you talk to them, you ask, you ask them the same, this, the same question and, and, um, what they sort of repeatedly say is that there's no way, there's no way that, that the higher ups, I guess, couldn't have known that this was going on. And, um, you know, whether there's any proof of that, I think is, is that's tough. That's tough to, to decipher who knew what and when, uh, but one thing that they, you know, pretty much everyone that we spoke with was adamant about is that that it was impossible because of how rampant it was. It was impossible that 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 there were people um, in, in leadership right. positions that, that that didn't know this was going on. You know, Laura, you shine. You two shown a pretty bright light on this thing. But you also quote that same David Mann I mentioned a minute ago, and I'll paraphrase, saying, "We're not much further along than we were years ago." Is that a fair assessment? of where this situation lies? Well, I, I think in any situation where you have um, prosecutions ongoing that don't seem to measure up to the scale of the abuse, there are, go there are people who are most directly impacted by the conduct at the Youth Development Center are going to naturally feel that um, the the response is inadequate to what they have endured. And um, I think that there is something uh, very troubling for them to have to listen to a legislative debate about the compensation fund that is uh, being deliberated by, by state lawmakers and uh, parsing whether the people who were just physically abused uh, should be excluded from that fund? Should it just be set aside for those who are, are sexually yeah. abused? It sort of um, misses the mark and so far as that they were uh, put in a place that was not of their choosing and uh, the what happened to them is yeah. goes beyond the pale of what they're, the reason that they were pla placed there for. Well, Dugan Arnett, Laura Cromaldi, I hope you keep digging. I'm sure you will, and so far you've done terrific and important work. Thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Okay, thank you.